Hello there everyone and thank you for rejoining me into No The Last Is Of Europe. I'm your host, Mr. Mocha Lover. But right now, we are playing once again as Gerard Wallop, in which we are doing our sound stock. If you want to read this one again, please go ahead. But this time, instead of taking uh, a legacy worth preserving, we're going to go with I will not let Britain continue to stagnate into the bloody hands of narrow-minded bureaucrats. Mother Nature smiles as the established order breaks. Social credit has proven itself as a future for England and her stock. The eldest cause, the difficulties that we have faced cannot be overstated. And we can rightly celebrate having overcome them, however. We cannot rest easy on our laurels, a course must be charted. Sighing inwardly. The king wondered himself, for not for the first time, when Wallop's speech would end, he was used to boredom during privy council meetings, and which usually consisted of whining about the perception of doing something or other. The dull clearly rehearsed speech, though, bored him even more. Thank God it wasn't Bedford speaking, at least. A new bold curse set by, or course, set by loyal servants of his majesty and the crown. We simply continue as we have to cast England off into the abyss, now is the time for action. Our turn of our land of proper English tradition can be done only by decisive leadership from a newly empowered crown, free from the bickering that plagues the commons to that end. This government shall embark upon a number of initiatives, commencing with issuance of crown credit to the deserving revival of proper country traditions and the investment of vast sums in agriculture. Ever blank, staring around the room in confusion. The reactions of his men around him range from bewilderment, matching his own to shocked fury on the face of Chesterton, as well as even excellent or excitement in Bedford's case. Had Wallop simply made that part of the speech up on the spot, or lovely joke Gerard Thunder Chesterton startling him, but I think it's time we got back to the real matters. Wallop raised an eyebrow in response for replying, You would refer to me as Prime Minister, Arthur, and I can promise you that I mean every word. We must have gone stark, raving mad then, Chesterton snarled, his coarse voice having abandoned gentlemanly character completely. None of us will support you when you spat on our friend's grave like this, not until you regain your wits. He stormed from the room, followed by a number of men. Walt watched him go, seemingly briefly regretful, before shaking his head and resuming his speech. Ever wasn't listening, though. All he could do was simply sit there, st still as a statue, terrified of just what madness Walt would drag him into. God save the king, as we break the final shackles. Time is set now. This is our moment. This is our one chance before it is too late to see our vision through. The lame duck ministries of Donville and Chesterton were clearly shirking their duties of fulfilling the true vision of a fascist Britain, and should no longer be considered as merely good enough. We must not only accept the perfection that we aim for in the days of, his, of, his, of the mystery and the airy. Chesterton and Donville were the friends of the nation, however, sometimes bad friends pop up, and in this case, those friends only lead to failure. Chesterton and his large group of supporters betrayed the party, but the sudden stab at the back will not stop us, of course. We shall stand strong against the weakness. The wishes of the Duke of Bedford shall be fulfilled, and with the current leadership, the Earl of Portsmouth shall never fall, despite Chesterton's best efforts. Look left, look right, the hills are bright, the dales are light between, because tis fifty years to-night that God has saved the king. The wall of cabinet. And here is the cabinet, if you'd like to read about this again. Very cool. Planting seeds. The Cunningham family. Oh, oh, I read this before. Going about planting seeds, please go ahead. It's Bob... English countryside and what we have to do, but am I not proper English stock in the country blooms, a garden, and a grave? Dear Mr. Godno, though the decision to appoint you to Chancellor is out of my hands, and I still feel as though I'm committing a great betrayal in leaving this office to you. The idea of a pagan folk dancer being placed in charge of the Einheit's Pact's second largest economy is a ludicrous one, and yet the Prime Minister is committed to this course of action. Regarding your economic policies, I have recently taken the time to read H.C.H. Douglas, and I find this theory so lacking in credibility or feasibility that it baffles me why you and Wallop are so eager to implement policies that shall do great harm to our economy. It baffles me that an incoming chancellor believes in rapid injection and extraction of money in circulation. It shocks me that you could believe there is such an appreciable difference in the flow of payments made to households and payments to firms. It terrifies me that I have given genuine consideration to retrieving my daughter's old economics books and, t and copying, copying them for you on the section on inflation. You have your disposal's majesty's treasury, which includes thousands of civil servants and bureaucrats learned and experienced in economics. Were it in my power, I would command you to listen to them and not to my nationally pursued, untested, untried, and unsound theory. Instead, I can only ask that you listen to their reasoning and hope that yours, that yours wins out. Regards, Rab Butler. It is dismissed without a second thought. And if you want to read about uh, a green and pleasant lamb, please go right ahead. Oh, what is this? Well, inflation rate modifier. Oh, that's not good. But we get more weakness, stability, and... Oh, huh. worst support. Go on for character. Social credit is a simple economic theory. It's relatively self, or as a true genius to that end, can only be discovered through close examination. The theory posits that the government should issue lines of credit at effectively free money to businesses and people in order to revitalize the economy. The genius of this is that it virtually removes the role of bankers in the flow of money and gets rid of much of their vile cancerous influence on English stock. This theory is obviously quite convincing, and we'll implement it as quickly as possible, with, of course, an authentically English twist. Instead of giving out money en masse, we'll try to target nearly all of our lines of credit at the countryside. Incentivize small businesses to return to the soil through advantages social credit will bring. Oh, the economy tax was uh, changed to crown credit. Our minimum month 
money creation would be set to 12%. Oh, God. Um, oh, increases GDP by 0.4 billion. But now you may stare as you like, and there's nothing to scam. And brushing your elbow on guest at and not to be told, they carry back bright to the coiner and the mintage of man. The lads that'll die in the glory and never be old. Redress the rigors of the inclement climb, dear Sir Arthur Bryant. It has been heartening to write this letter to you in these circumstances. Your appointment to a higher office has long been overdue. We have worked together for so long in the mystery and elsewhere that I consider it natural that you should join me too in the cabinet. You and I know the British values are but a distant memory these days. It is our sacred duty to revive them, but it is your duty to promote them within the Isles, through Europe and over the entire world. But before we can do this, we must engage in unseemly business. Germany, Germany remains supreme, and so long as the continent remains uh, within the control, we'll need their support. Though I served only a brief time in a position and under irregular circumstances, I found that half my time was spent appraising them. Our charter course towards the revitalization of English land shall put us into the conflict with the conglomerates. I have a plan to alleviate this, but I will need your assistance. So expect a meeting from me in the future. Consider this your first trial for you. One of many moments when we must appease a sick man of a master, God willing. When the continent chokes on its own bills, England shall remain, claim her rightful place in the world. When that day comes, I want you beside me. You have written a great deal about history, but now you have the opportunity to enter it. Kind regards. Uh, this guy inspires both dread and hope the former more than the latter in defense of beauty hey poverty's going way down look at that holy crap the stress and the fatigue have been burning in him and his show slouching against the lord's lounge and his eyes barely staying open uh, he did not make a good look for the camera that was being pointed at his face you know this is his first public appearance in two weeks he forced upon himself and began the introduction was finished um my lord, in this day and age, we've been utterly exhausted, mostly from the multiple uprisings of treacherous cowards unwilling to look at the world around them. And unfortunately, we have also fallen into the same trap as the capital six snakes that tore this country to shreds in the first place. He said, paused, letting it sink into the room around him. We've forgotten about the beauty of nature and how reliant people across the globe are to the agriculture industry. While well, such an industry, famines will befall, befall thousands of families and many have time for a new source of income. The sounds of the chamber both haunted and empowered the prime minister continue on after a few seconds of pause, and yet. The greedy, selfish industrials continue to pump kilograms of toxic chemicals into our dirt while tearing through resources faster than a machine gun. They farm this nation to the extent comparable to the uprising, my lords. We must have this essential tool of the capitalistic nations now. I hope, my lords, all here in the defense of the nation's beauty will take a stand against such activities. Thank you. A standing ovation followed the Prime Minister's proposal. Shocked by such a positive response, Wallop turned to the Duke of Bedford behind him, who in turn gave Wallop a white smile. Turning again to face the opposition, Wallop saw the same story. Everyone on the other side clapped in a quieter manner. Although the reason to him is unknown, but this supermajority was its minority, which Wallop saw and chalked it up to pure arrogance, an easy cause to rally around, I suppose. I picked a stone and named it. Shun the coward, shun the traitor. Shun all those who bring low all the, that is immoral and decent for their own sick ends. That is the mantra of Gerard Wallop's new government. There's no need to make nice with the rabble any longer. All traces of those who oppose the Earl Portsmouth and his ascension need to be utterly expunged from the PPP. Whether it be butler or his weak will corporate stooges, or Fountain is dim with rabble. No new challenge of new government shall be given any quarter. Perhaps the more junior members may be allowed to stay, perhaps not, but with this one fell swoop, a stone shall be cast that knocks away any meaningful opposition to the new Edwardian era. Where crouching tigers wait their hapless prey. Dear Mr. Hastings Russell, twelfth Duke of Bedford, there is a part of me that shall always respect you. You are among the founders of a British People's Party, which has tried to serve its namesake diligently since the war. As a party which I shall remain loyal to until I am dead. Yet I also mourn the rest of your career and find your new appointment to this office concerning. To be frank, you had an opportunity when you were Prime Minister, and you blew it. No, only did you break under pressure, you let Chesterton into power, whose mistakes you will be fixing for years to come. Wallop's best decision was keeping that old drunk as far from the cabinet as possible, but among all his worst decisions, appointing you to the Home Office might be the, among the highest. I don't know what Wallop sees in you, that he would drag you out of the coffin sh you should have stayed in. Maybe he remembers you and your wife's tiff in the press and took pity. Maybe he's gone mad too. Just do me a favor and don't blow your brains out once you break under the pressure yet again and have the dignity to, have, to resign first. Regards, Andrew Fountaine. Yeah, like any other tantrum, there's nothing but pity in its recipients. Gilded branches. Mr. Miss Evans began the letter. Following a government audit of the private enterprise in uh, Hedfisher, your shop has been deemed sufficiently productive to claim credit vouchers on behalf of His Majesty's government. The enclosed leaflet contains further information regarding how credit vouchers may be applied on circumstances which under they will be accepted. We wish you the best of luck in your productive enterprises. The leaflet gave more details along with assurances that wherever pounds were good, so were credit vouchers, so long as Clara could tell, I was actually trying to tell her that the government has made a new type of money just for people like her, supposedly purely to help her diversify her goods and expand her business. Clara, Clara scoffed, sliding the letter aside uh, on the shop counter before sliding a cigarette. What utter rubbish. People have no decency, none at all. She knew the times were hard, but swindling the desperate with fake government letters was just vile. The idiots could have tried to make it plausible, plausible at least. London were carrying enough to send her on money. 
Now that was a ride. Then again, she thought while looking around at the empty shop, the day was going slow, and the dress in the unclosed Aunt Letha was really a government office. She knew it well enough. She could at least see what the fuss was all about. She resolved, pulling on her coat and flipping the shop sign closed. It was her surprise that when she actually arrived at the government office, she wasn't alone. There was a long line of people she recognized stretched past the building. There was Arthur from the pharmacy and Helena from the grocers. Each person she noticed clutched the same letter she did. So shocked the letter had been a trick, she suddenly fled in a line, briefly. She wondered just where the government had gotten the money for all this, but to be honest, she didn't care. Things were hard and the shop needed it. As far as Clara was concerned, the Prime Minister could figure it out. And we do have a cup of decaf coffee here to keep us nice and rejuvenated. A budget free from usury. Mm. Rolf Gardner was an unusual chancellor for the Checker. For once, he had no background in economics, save for his advocacy for social credit. Secondly, he was a very inexperienced and junior parliamentarian. I was generally seen as having been promoted because the Prime Minister wanted someone who would echo his own thoughts on economics. Even the old guard of the party were outraged by his appointment, seeing him as an incompetent upstart. They were right, Rolf Gardner was indeed not a competent chancellor and did not have any real economic knowledge, yet he was the man Gerard Wallop turned to today to build his budget to destroy usury. First of all, Prime Minister, I would suggest building a system of subsidies for rural areas. First and foremost, of course, agricultural subsidies, but also subsidies through which reform of uh, credit vouchers for small businesses willing to move away from the cities. Secondly, we need to get rid of the price controls. They should never have been introduced. And they're a tool of banking, which will damage our stock more than for every day they remain. Lastly, most importantly, we need to start creating more money in order to give our people the right to, de uh, to debt-free purchasing power. I bring a list detailing your targets for this year. While not at his ascent to all this, the ideas were the ones he had proposed on many occasions, and Gardner may have well been speaking with his own voice, which of course is why he was appointed in the first place. If usury falls, how much of Burns economy will survive it? The land we tilled. The soil cries for English stock to till it, and deep down the very souls of the Englishmen cry out for the chance to perform that noble task. It was the Englishman's role and the right to tend to England's uh, rich land. But sadly, the evils of finance, capitalism, usury, and cosmopolitanism have done much to sever the spiritual link between the Englishman and his land, rendering him powerless to fight against their influence. We must correct this if we were to have any hope of reviving the England of old, before the tides of history wipe out it forever. We shall start giving the agricultural sector the credit it needs to assume its proper place as a primary industry. Increase GDP a little bit. Uh, modify oak and ash with less research speed, more max factories in the state, more weekly stability and war support. It dawns in Asia, tombstones show, and Shropshire names are red. And the now spills is overflow beside the Severn's dead, and desolation saddens all thy green, dear Prime Minister. As a former candidate for Prime Minister, deny the office by your arrival, I feel compelled to write to you in the days following your victory. I assume that Fountaine uh, was too churlish to even grant you the dignity of a similar response. When I first heard of your intent to become a Prime Minister, I expected a continuation of former governments instead upon hearing of your cabinet. I recall a conversation we shared just before the Civil War. It seems that you have finally become the Mussolini of agriculture. Lord Protector of English stock, still unlike Fontaine's lot, you did at least did Britain the courtesy of appointing men familiar with agricultural matters and not just rhetoric. What concerns me is more of your full throated approval for dangerous economic policies. I've already written at length to your new Chancellor of the Exchequer, but I expect my concerns have been ignored. Therefore, I will approach you directly. Your policies of Crown Credit will be an unmitigated disaster. You cannot purchase economic prosperity in this manner without a great risk of runaway prices and crippling your ability to keep up. It's akin to a man shooting himself in the foot in the hopes that the wound, open wound, might make him more aerodynamic. I implore you as a former chancellor who kept our economy stable during moments of great difficulty to reconsider all these policies which threatened to immiserate the British, British people and put her financial situation into jeopardy. Whatever you might think of Douglas's theories, they are unsound and untested, and rather than even uh, beyond, or rather than even a measure of trial, you're approaching this task with a broad, broad brush. For the sake of our country, turn back now before it's too late. Regards, Rob Butler. They just ignore for its lateness, its prudence, and its whiny character. Cool. Hey, we like weekly stability and war support, right? So the Baron Kila takeover, huh? So, let's read about this. Social credit. C.H. Douglas, in his description of a model of economics in which debt-free purchasing power is supplied to all citizens, viewed as a method by which the machinations of the inner circles of high finance could be overcome, fascists who believe in the social credit make the implicit identity of said inner circles explicit. They brand financial institutions, both domestic and international, as Jewish plots or dominance, and seek to overturn this conspiracy with a deployment of social credit. For the second social credit fascists, the influence of Jewish bankers begets the destruction of national uh, traditions. 
uh, through their church market manipulation, virtue is made worthless and vice made profitable. The people are thus drawn to abandoning God and country in favor of aimless decadence. To these fascists, it is but another problem of the artificial scarcity resolved by the distribution of purchasing power by subsidizing the righteous and making virtue profitable through social credit. These fascists believe that they can restore national values from the moral waste of modernity. Their critics are many and their points are plentiful, but social credit is still a young ideology on the world stage. It's fascist child even younger. Time will tell whether their dreams can be realized or if their delusional voyage we shattered against the rocks of reality. And across the barren pastures, IG Fob and Siemens Volkswagen. They may come by many names, but we have names for them as well. The names were in the bane of Leech and Pillager. Since war, they have descended upon us, eagerly feasting on Britain's green hills and calm fields like a vast horde of locusts. The state of affairs continue, not continue as it did under Downfell, so WAP is devised. A cunning plan needs their own rapaciousness against them. Manchester, Birmingham, and the other industrial haunts shall be offered as playgrounds to them on the condition they leave the countryside well alone. Their unrestrained greed will create a drive to the countryside just as we wish. Buy us time for a greater push against them and prepare Britain's people for the day we root them out further. Decreases GDP a little more. Inflation goes up higher. Better monthly poverty rate. Industrial regulations policy improves. There was a king reigning in the east. There when kings were, were well set to feast. They get their fill before they think with poison meats and poison drink. A flood of fertilizer. On the Prime Minister's desk lay an act. Put forward by the Department of Agriculture and approved by the Commons and Lords alike. Now they looked at it directly. He realized it was no great betrayal. One little signature, a few strokes of the pen, and Gerard Walp had sealed a new compact between the cities and the countryside. The 1965 Industrial Renovation Act laid a frame work for his government's future industrial policy, which concentrated the corporations towards the cities. Corporate taxes on assets in the countryside would be severely increased, heavy enough to drive them from the hills and plains in the cities, however. Conditions would be far more favorable. Minimum wages would be slashed across the board, guaranteeing cheaper labor. <coughs> Second care by which Wallop uh, would contain the German corporations they could have the cities with its pollution, environmental, and spiritual, so long as they did not touch the countryside. They would know what to do with these concrete prisons and their architects. Wallop cared for far more for the country where English spirit would find some succor and salvation. He planned to see the British economy shift away, its attention away from the cities to the villages. Even Crown Credit would spur on this transition. Nice. Outside his window, a uh, London smog ro rose to its peak. A grey haze swirled around the city, skip choking the life out of its inhabitants. Even here, a wall could taste that pollution in the air. He stood aside the act and looked out the side of the window. He imagined a worse smokestacks billowing, poison filling the airs and lungs. The Thames and green with runoff. Uh, except that it would get worse. If it makes him happy, the Germans could have the city so long as the English have the country. Pockets of pollution with concentrated shall not spill out over the land. It helps us with a little bit more growth. God, money creation. Mm. Political parties monthly rate. Huh? The Holy Church of England. Well, one might assume that the Lord Portsmouth sees the Lord the crown as England's most important body. This assumption will be incorrect. The most important body by far is the church, who safeguards the English soul and spirit after shown generations of paths of salvation. Therefore, the new government, maintaining a strong relationship to the church, is essential for Algerian revival, as the farmer's bond with the land is just as much a spiritual one as it is a physical one. Walp will make sure to meet with the new Archbishop of Canterbury in order to make clear his plans for the special relationship between the church and this government, and then he will also make it clear that he wishes to see some cleaning up in the church, as well as some godless souls that have unfortunately slipped through the net and hold high positions there. The bells they sound on Bredon, and it's still the steeples hum. Come all to the church, good people, oh noisy bells be dumb, I hear you, I will come. Something about weeds? Containing weeds. Bedford slowly crept his way up to the small stage. He blamed it on his bad back and a poor night's sleep, although this, he was the type of person that would much rather lie to himself. The hundreds of German executives staring straight into him as he crept closer frightened him. His disdain for these men had only grown further as he grown closer to the power, and thus climbing the scent would not pause his day. He found himself. Uh, at the center of the tension in the room. Fine, this is cute to speak, he cleared his throat. Thank you, everyone, for attending this evening. I'm sure that has been a long commute here from Germany. I would not make all of you come this way for any bad news, so let me get this straight to the point. And his eyes gazed through the hundreds of heads. He had come to know many of these men, these faces and suits, these blank people. And his own time as prime minister, although many of them simply blurred together, but Bedford thought of nothing of it. Our government has been initiating a plan to raise funding to the Department of Agriculture and bring high taxes to corporations in the countryside. However, it has also brought a lower minimum wage to the industrial cities. A very daunting offer, gentlemen. The more Bedford spoke, the more groans could be heard in some areas. Some turned to speak to the man to his side. He feared that they thought this was just a game to settle old scores. Bedford resumed to stop the banner between executives. I know what many of you are thinking, however. These thoughts are profoundly incorrect. 
The Ministry of Lord Portsmouth only seeks to focus its efforts on the countryside and as a benefit that saves it would be in all of your industrial capable hands. But for soon initiated vote where almost every man raised their hand in favor of idiots all of them, the scene of money only dragged them further to the goal of ours. They are sealing their own fate, soon they would pay. Bever tried to hide his smile as he left the podium. I knew youth identity. The youth in these modern times have been, for lack of better words, dormant, decadent, and idle. They drift aimlessly from day to day, shying away from honest work in favor of drinking, dancing, and other moral degeneration. And if that was not enough, they turn to alternative forms of entertainment, downright criminal ones at that. Our nation's future is at the hands of the next generation, and if this trend continues, then our legacy will be reduced to a degenerate, morally defunct shell of what it once was. Action must be taken quickly. The cure of this disease is the folk traditions of old. They keep the nation together for centuries before, and the return to them is the exact solution we require. Thankfully, we've already had a volunteer to spear this effort. They're already expert on folk tradition revivals and revivals of Gardner. They'll hand in the reins and steer the course for the next generation. They will leave their homes, tell you the visions and other luxuries, and learning the value of good, honest work. The Oaks are tomorrow, but first we've got to read about the English Inquisition. It is by God's grace, said K.P. Schwabscher. Archbishop of Canterbury, that this cathedral still stands despite our wharves. He bowed his head and seated in the darkness of his church. I believe it's a sign, Lord Portsmouth. He has blessed our efforts, protected his flock. Gerard Wallop nodded. They sat on their own choir pews, Schwabber, Schwabcher, behind Wallop, with the moonlight filtered through the stained glass. Archbishop, he said. England is in a spiritual crisis. In such times, it has been the church that has led them out of the inner darkness and towards the proper light. We shall do our duty for king and country, Prime Minister. Schwabcher. I picked up the Bible next to him. As for our sermons, I have spoken to my bishops. We are in agreement. Church Christ's humble origins must be taught. He opened his book to the freshest annotations. Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary? As followers, too, he turned his pages. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, for they were fishers. Men of the land, said Wallop, as all proper Englishmen should be. Land untainted by decadence. I have another sermon for that. He leaped through a few, few, through a few more pages. He found in the temple those that often sold ox and sheep and doves and the changes for money sitting. Another nod from Wallop, what are the other matter at this? Schwabscher silently handed over an envelope tucked into his Bible. It, in 24 hours, a priest in clothes will be known to the British Free Corps. Your dedication is appreciated, Archbishop. Wallop rose, placed a hand on the Archbishop's shoulder. For we are now reunited. The bonds between church and state are reforged. All is well in the King's speech. We have tried uh, each and every one of our theories in encountering successes beyond our wildest dreams. Even so, we must not forget that it is under the Crown's guidance that our glorious works have been brought to fruition. All that we do, we do in His Majesty's name, recognizing the Crown's rightful place as the highest authority in England and undisputed symbol of dignity, leadership, and strength. It is only right that His Majesty Edward VIII shall be the one to announce the official beginning of England's return to her rightful roots and present social credit to the masses. When our children speak of the history of our fair isle and its return to splendor, they should be able to say that the Edwardian restoration began today. More political power, weekly stability, and weekly war support, better political parties, monthly rate, and more inflation, but what else is new? Come you home a hero, or come home not at all. The lad you leave will mind you till Ludlow Tower shall fall. The Oaks of Tomorrow, watching the TV over dinner, becomes something of a ritual for the Stevenson family. Every day, when John returned from school, his father, Nicholas, would put it on something entertaining while his wife, Emily, cooked dinner. Out of the chaos recently, it was nice to just sit down, relax, and watch the BBC over a nice roast. Tonight, however, with the program's a little, uh, ah, the new chancellor, that God in a fellow, was presenting some sort of dancing troupe, only they were all boys about John's age, and they had swords, real swords, all very peculiar. You have any idea what all this is, Nicholas? Heard anything at all at work? Asked Emily, looking about as confused as her husband. Nicholas was about to respond in the negative until the boys all started marching across the screen and then suddenly clicked. I don't have anything for certain, darling, but this reminds me a lot of the Hitler youth group we were taking to see on a business trip with IG Farben back in 61. They even got the same little armbands and drums. As he said that, the implications of it sank in. Both parents turning towards the blissfully unaware son eating his meal in peace before looking up at each other again. No words were needed. Nicholas would be in contact with his friend in the Department of Education in the morning and see if exemptions could be made. As they reached for the remotes to change channels, uh, waving a British flag filled the screen as a banner along the bottom read, The Young English Kindred Applied Today. Before John could even look up to see what the commotion was, it was gone, a documentary on birds in Scotland playing in its place. They could stare it up for now, but for how long? I walked in lonely, lonely Wessex lanes afar. Before a war consumed the aisles, the political establishment dismissed us as madmen, lunatics, and a deranged gang of reactionaries that could never see beyond the gates of Westminster. Even once we were given a sliver of chance to assume our rightful place in a power under Bedford, the British People's Party went out of the way to disgrace any action we would take before we were similarly ejected. And as England's true sons returned to Downing Street, there was a great howling, wailing, and gnashing of teeth amongst the establishment. Let them cry, as much as they wish to, they continue to grasp the reins of power, they do not, and victory has never tasted quite as sweet as before. The Edwardian restoration has begun in earnest, and this government shall bring the nation back to where it should have been centuries ago. God save the king, and may he look down favorably upon England and her stock. 
Hurts inflation more, more research, less research speed. Lie down, lie down, young yeoman. What used to rise and rise? Rise a man a thousand mornings, yet down at last he lies. And then the man is wise, a.e. houseman, a Shropshire lad. Heavy lies the head. But look at this. Deficit's not bad. Growth is okay. Inflation's going up, unfortunately. And this hasn't improved very much. Heavy lies the head. Your Majesty, Your Majesty, would you like some water? Edward, give a weak nod, continually on the banister at the foot of the stairs for support. You can hear the camera crews upstairs taking in what could be the clearly thousand of whisper about his nerves. What could they possibly know about their nerves? About nerves, when all they did was operate a camera. Nerves were too, for men caged in a country that despises them, filled with vile communists that wanted him dead, and a jump rabble like Donville and Chesterton, who saw him as nothing more than a figurehead. It was the brutal joke of the moment a prime minister had seemingly ready to acknowledge his importance. It was a madman like Wallop. The servant returned, carrying a glass of water which the king gratefully accepted. Yeah, yes, good, thank you. I'll be up shortly. A servant frowned. Your Majesty, if you're feeling well, we can delay. Uh, no, shouted Edward a little too suddenly. No, he repeated to the startled servant. We'll do it now. I'm quite well. Tell them I'm ready to, be, to begin. He drained the glass in a single gulp, handed it back before following the other man up the stairs. Every step seemed to take an eternity, slumping to a seat before the cameras. He thought gloomily of the youth towards his prince, and the cheers and adoration that followed him then. Fickle guys, how was he able to have known that Hitler was such a brute when the man seemingly seemed so reasonable? He wondered what fresh curses they would split, spit in his name when he preached Wallop's lunacy at him. Your Majesty, beginning in five seconds. Four. Three. Two. Edward breathed in deep. And forced an empty smile. It wasn't fair, none of it was fair. Good afternoon, I'm speaking to you today as your sovereign to announce the beginning of a grand program of revival. For too long, the people of this country have been distant from the very land in which they live and produce. We were nearly caught in the throat. Speak of you, speak you fool, unless you want to end up in cage as Pew Yi in Manchuria. I encourage each and every one of you to participate in that program, such as the young English kindred and credit issuance will, the King's Speech, and Earl's words. Well, this poverty's getting better. For those who would fight time, the two men strolled through the checkers gravel path at a leisurely pace, followed only by the chirping of birds and the faint whistling of the wind. Walbert ordered all the ground keepers away until tomorrow, leaving the private guard and to the two of them alone. As he and Bedford turned a corner around a hedge back to the state, he was surprised to see what almost looked like tears in his friend's eyes. Noting his expression of concern, Bedford wiped them away. I'm so sorry, Gerard. It's just that I was so dearly inspired. It's clear, dearly inspiring, wasn't it? His Majesty's speech, the way he expressed ideas the country desperately needed to hear. I could tell he meant every word. A moment for all of England to remember, agreed Wallop. It's a shame. Uh, Arthur, no, Chesterton can't see it, but our visions come far. You've gone further than I ever could, said Bedford, without a trace of bitterness, his teary eyes gleaming with admiration. And I promise that for as long as you need me, I will be there for each and every step. Thank you, old friend. They continued walking until they came to a small patio table with a decanter of scotch and two glasses. Bedford wrinkled his nose at the alcohol, giving Wallop a questioning look. Just this once, Hastings coaxed Wallop, uncorking the decanter before pouring the contents in a glass and extending it to Bedford. We'll be too busy for peaceful moments like these. Soon. The peers need strengthening and the corporations need rooting out. Just in a very smile. Well, oppose us. Let them try as they like. No one will stand in our way. He poured himself a second glass and sat down. To his majesty then, asked Bedford, raising his glass. Wallop smiled and nodded. To his majesty. As they drank, none of the men noticed the clouds on the horizon beginning to darken. Across Britain. A air of uncertainty hangs heavy. The people in the cities furrow their brows in confusion and worry as news of the new social credit-driven economy filters out of Downing Street. The people in the countryside are left only to wonder what on earth ruralism even means for them and their livelihoods. And what remains of any resistance to the government's new direction, whether they be collaborator or not, lies broken and miserable, the stench of failure hanging heavy. Gerard Wallop, on the other hand, has never been happier. And why should he not be? His dreams of breaking free from the chains of the last remnants of monetary power in favor of pursuing his true vision for Britain has come true. International finance comes cowards in fear, as you know that England and her stock will soon return to the fields that made them strong in the first place. The year is 1965, and Britain has made her choice, although whether it is one shall, she shall come to regret is yet to be seen, my friends. It's interesting, the whole system here, it doesn't seem too bad, as long as the debt to GDP ratio is not too bad, and we can increase our uh, credit rating, I think it'd be well, so far okay, even though, and poverty's getting better too, but hey, if you enjoyed the social credit version of Gerard Wallop, please consider leaving a fat fat like. Subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below. And I'll see you tomorrow to see what else. Well, I guess we're done with this campaign. See you in another campaign. Thanks for watching. Have a tremendous rest of your day.